welcome everybody to another edition of this uh, Crypto and Blockchain Economics Research Forum uh, webinar series. Today we have a symposium of two exciting papers. The first one being on decentralized trading and decentralized exchange design, and the second one on DAO governments. Now, um, just a, a few logistical items. We have the chat disabled, but we have a Q&A function. Uh, and you can ask a question in the Q&A so that um, you know, the speaker could answer them um, at some point later in the talk. I will be monitoring the Q&A and in most cases, we'll be asking the question to the speaker. Um, and we have two co-authors in the room who may uh, take some time to potentially answer some of these questions in the Q&A too. Um, so uh, other than that, uh, this is a symposium where we have two papers. Uh, each paper gets 45 minutes. So our running time is from now to 12.30. Um, each paper will be presented over roughly 30 minutes. Um, the speakers have asked the speakers to take two short pauses where uh, you as the audience can ask them clarifying questions. And then we have an extended Q&A session. Now, the way we do this today is that both papers will be presented back to back. And we ask for the larger Q&A to be held at the very end of the webinar. Um, but if you have clarifying questions, as I said, you can ask them in between. So without further ado, uh, I would like to introduce our first speaker, which is Mateos uh, Javier Ferreira. I hope I get the name right. And uh, he will be talking about credible decentralized exchange design via verifiable sequencing rules. Uh, Mateos, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, just share. Thank you very much uh, for the invitation. Uh, so I'm very excited uh, to talk to today about this uh, work we've been doing on, on transparency and decentralized exchanges. Uh, so it's a joint work with uh, David Parks um, uh, here at Harvard. Uh, and it's a work we are gonna be presenting at uh, uh, Stock uh, in June. Um, so it's a major theory conference. Uh, so it's something we were very excited about. So the main motivation for this work is uh, the trading of digital assets. Uh, so as most of you probably know, like Bitcoin created this new class of assets where they are traded in, in blockchains. And primarily there is two main ways you might trade digital assets. So for example, trade Bitcoin for um, Ethereum. Uh, you can use a centralized exchange like Binance, which has uh, around a trading volume, a daily trading volume of $15 billion a day. Uh, or you can use a decentralized exchange like Uniswap, which has around $1 billion a day, which is kind of comparable to the trading volume of Coinbase. Uh, the way these uh, exchanges work on the centralized case, uh, what you do is that you essentially transfer uh, your assets to the exchange wallet. So the exchange becomes the custodian of your assets. Uh, and some limitations of this approach is that often you're going to have a higher trading fees uh, because the uh, exchange locks your capital in and you, that's the only platform you can really trade. Uh, another uh, risk you might have here is there is often low transparency. Uh, so a classic example is uh, the FTX. A collapse last year, which was one example of a centralized exchange that uh, they lost their customer uh, funds. Uh, and that was not really the first time uh, something like that happened, uh, which really motivates this idea of uh, decentralized exchanges, where is in a high level is a way that you can trade your digital assets uh, without transferring it to someone else. So yourself uh, remain the custodian of your assets, then you can I directly trade against a blockchain contract. Um, so what, however, what's gonna be the uh, main focus on my talk is, is often the, uh, the market manipulations that you, uh, you see have taking place on decentralized exchanges. Uh, and I'm gonna go over uh, uh, one idea we have uh, about how we can meet manipulations on these exchanges. So it's really uh, about like, not only bringing the transparency that these exchanges um, provide, but also 
how you can really also make them more secure for users. So a little bit of a, a background on how these exchanges work. So uh, in a high level, when you, a trader wants to trade in a decentralized exchange, they send their transactions to what we call a block builder. Uh, in, in the case of approval of state blockchains, or it can be often it's called like a miner, uh, traditionally a miner in like in a proof of work blockchain like Bitcoin where the builder is gonna really compose the block contain uh, user transactions and the transactions they are ordered. So there's a, there's a ordering of transactions in the block. Uh, and this block is gonna be passed to a proposer who's gonna validate that block and really execute to those transactions in the blockchain. Uh, and what's gonna be important here is that the ordering of transactions is gonna influence how much you actually gonna pay for your transaction. So why is that? So uh, a little bit of background on how Uniswap works, which is going to be the main exchange with, uh, that we... Uh, so in the paper, we have a more general definition for, for decentralized exchange, but uh, for now, uh, let's think only about the, the case of Uniswap. So the case of Uniswap, the way it works is that uh, you have a, a third entity called a, a liquidity provider who's going to lock capital in a contract uh, so we're going to have two types of tokens. So we say token one or token two, which could be like say Bitcoin or Ethereum, where XI is going to be how many units of uh, token I that was locked in the contract. Uh, and that defines what we call the state of the exchange. And with this state, uh, we can define this concept of, of a potential uh, of a potential for a particular state. So in the case of Uniswap, the potential function at the state X is going to be the product of the amount that was locked in the uh, in the contract. So it's the product X1 times X2. And the way that a trade is going to take place is that you can purchase a Q units of token one, as long as the payment that you provide, the payment P, uh, preserves the potential of the of this, uh, the potential of the exchange. So, so in a now, in practice, what happens is that we define this idea of a, of a curve, which a curve is, is, in a mathematical sense, is a, as a level set of this potential function. And you can, you can trade on this curve. So you're always, whenever you want to, you can like move the state of the exchange for any other state, as long as you, pres you remain on the curve. Uh, so for example, if you want to, in this example, if you want to buy units of token one, then you're reducing the amount of token one in the exchange, and Y is going to be how much you have to provide in token two. Um, so another example, if your state was instead of X1 prime here, so you're withdrawing Q units of token one, then the uh, Y, uh, the Y X gives you how much you have to deposit so that you remain on the curve. So, so just show you how the state you are in the curve in really influences how much you're gonna pay. Um, and of course, you're gonna really care about the state where your, your transaction is gonna execute. So what can go wrong on these exchanges? Um, so because the ordering of transactions influence the price, uh, we can have a situation where block builders, uh, they might be manipulating the ordering that transactions execute. So for example, if you wanna say buy if you have a transaction B2 you're, where you're buying Ethereum, then uh, the builder can see that and he, he can decide to buy Ethereum before the user, uh, which makes the price of, of Ethereum go up. Uh, and then they execute your transaction, which makes the price go up even more. Uh, and, and then they immediately sell the Ethereum that they just bought that transaction before. So it is what uh, is called the sandwich attack. Uh, and is one type of uh, what in the blockchain community we call maximum extractable value, which is, is this concept of how much uh, block builders could be uh, profiting by manipulating uh, these exchanges. Um, so in another picture, uh, well, the way the sandwich attacks work is that you have this transaction B2 from a user. So in, in, my, in my pictures, I'm gonna use uh, blue to denote transactions that are coming from users and red transactions that are, are coming from the builders. Uh, and I'm going to use the left arrow to denote 
to say that you're you're buying token one and and arrows moving to the left to the right means you're you're selling token one so if a user wants to buy a token then they are moving the curve to the left here what they what the sandwich attack is that they build their buys the token before the user then the user buys the token then they they build their uh, they they immediately sell the token they just bought before and they and they get a profit from that from the difference uh, so this is a, a very big problem on these decentralized exchanges so here you have one estimate uh, by this entity called flashbots where um, the estimate by probably by the end of this year we're going to have more than a billion dollars that have been lost by uh, this type of manipulations on decentralized exchanges uh, so it's kind of roughly around one one million dollars a day is is extracted by manipulating prices on these exchanges So uh, what can we do uh, about this? Uh, so there is a few approaches. So let me briefly just give a background. Uh, so this is the idea of computing uh, uniform pricing. Uh, so it was a work by Bodish et al. Uh, it was initially proposed for traditional, uh, to actually replace order books in traditional uh, finance, uh, where in a high level what you do is that you compute a uniform price uh, for all the transactions in a block. Um, so in one implementation is called is the call protocol, the call swap protocol. So a few limitations of that, they often you're going to have a higher cost, a higher latency. Uh, another limitation is that if you're designing a new contract, you actually have to attract additional liquidity to your contract. Um, so another really interesting direction has been on using this concept of encrypted transactions. So so the, the motivation is, where, is that if your transaction was encrypted, then potentially you could say, well, then people don't know what my transaction is going to do. So th then it would be harder for them to just front run and sandwich a transaction. Uh, but in practice, to actually make this work, you have to uh, solve a few problems. For example, if your transaction is encrypted, you need to ensure that there is a way for decrypting a transaction. Um, and you have to figure out okay, what should you do if someone refuses to decrypt a transaction. Um, you also have to ensure is this transaction if, if a transaction is encrypted, you need to check is this transaction valid or not. Uh, so those are questions you have to answer to uh, actually make these protocols work, and that has been uh, one of the main challenges uh, in in the area of encrypted uh, mempools. One uh, direction that received a lot of really what's the the main solution we currently have is this idea of using a, a trusted relay service like Flashbox Protect, uh, which is a service that essentially uh, promised that they are not going to front run user transactions. And that's going to really be the main focus on, on, of my talk. Um, so any questions so far? So I see nothing in the Q&A, um, and I think for now this is quite clear. Many people here will be familiar with the particular workings here of the of, uh, AMMs and the like, so just carry on. <laughs> Thank you. So a little bit of a, a backdrop to this idea. Uh, so there, when we are, when we're going to be, when I'm going to talk about this idea of decentralized exchange, I often be talking about this concept of credibility where uh, users are hoping their, their transactions is going to execute in a fair way. Uh, and this is actually a broader uh, research uh, agenda, not only for exchange design, but other types of mechanisms. So for example, in, in auctions, you might be worried about a seller mani manipulating prices in auctions. Uh, so it's, ge it's a general question of how we can design algorithms when the person who's going to be implementing your algorithm might be someone that's economically motivated. Uh, so, so it's some agenda is an agenda that I'm being very interested about, and is the reason I, I got interested in this decentralized exchange design, because uh, for the user's point of view, it looks like there is a lack of credibility on, on the current solutions. Um, uh, but this is how I, I want to just mention that there is this problem of credibility go beyond the blockchain domain. And even in the blockchains, like you have probably heard of transaction fees, mechanisms that's in that in that context is also a big concern that you should ensure your transaction fee mechanism would incentivize miners to not manipulate the, the 
the, the transaction fee of the protocol. So where our solution is going to be as follows. So it's going to be kind of similar to what the way Flashbot Protect works, where what we're going to do is that we're going to have a sequencer. It's going to be uh, one special block builder, and this block builder is going to promise that they are not going to front run and manipulate user transactions. Uh, the difference, though, is that Flashbots Protect is kind of is, is only based on trust. Like they don't provide any way for users to really verify if that promise is really um, being satisfied. And so now, in, in what we're going to focus, though, is we are going to ask, okay, can we design sequencers that can be audited, audited by users? Um, so the sequencer is going to essentially be a function that's going to be getting a uh, user transactions. The sequencer can uh, inject his own transactions together with user transactions, and he's going to output uh, one uh, the execution ordering. Uh, and you and the users can check if the output is really really could have been a, uh, the output of this of this function. And then the execution and then this block is going to execute in, in the blockchain contract. And what was going to be interesting here is that we actually want to execute transactions on top of Uniswap. So we are uh, leveraging the liquidity that already exists in the Uniswap contract. Uh, we are just simply changing the interaction between users and the blockchain contract. We are thinking, okay, can, how can we change the interaction between uh, traders and the blockchain so that that can make it uh, make these protocols more transparent for, for users. So our main result in this work was that we showed that there is a sequencer that ensures that for any user transaction that is included in a block, then the price they would be getting would be at least as good if their transaction was the only one executing. So for example, if, if transaction B2 was the only one in the block, or uh, the user might be getting a worse price, but provably uh, the sequencer or no party actually gain from that, like no party gains by executing the user transaction. So it, the equivalent statement here would be is if your transaction was, if some value was extracted from your transaction, then the price you're going to be getting is going to be at least as good as if your transaction was the only one executing. Um, Okay, so what is our sequencing rule that we can actually achieve this, uh, this dream uh, solution? So first, let me formalize the model we we're gonna be working on. So each transaction, they're either gonna take one of two forms. They're either buying a token one or they're selling um, a transaction by uh, a buy order specified that you wanna buy Q units of token one and, and specify the minute. Uh, the maximum you're willing to pay. Uh, but equivalently, a sale order is uh, specifying how much you want to sell uh, in token one and uh, the minimum you wanted to receive in token two for as a payment. And for this talk, I'm, uh, as I said, I'm going to be assuming we are trading against the Uniswap uh, product market maker. So a formal definition of what the sequence verifiable sequencing rule is. So a sequence rule is essentially a function or that maps uh, a state of the exchange before any transaction execute uh, and um, in the collection of uh, a collection of transaction or a set of, of transactions to a non-apt collection of orderings. So it maps a state in a set of transactions to a to what we call valid orderings. Uh, as I said, the sequencer can add or censor transactions from the set, so he can. So some of these transactions can belong to the sequencer, and there's no way for you to know which ones are are, are coming from the sequencer, which ones are coming from users. Um, so the sequencer is free to manipulate the input to this function as he wants. Uh, so for practical reasons, you want this sequencing rule to be efficient, which means that you should have a uh, efficient way to actually find uh, one ordering on this collection, right? So this, this is just, if this is not true, then you really, this is not a practical uh, sequence rule if you cannot compute a, a valid ordering. And importantly, it needs to be verifiable, which means that if once a user sees um, 
the execution order that comes out of the sequencer, they should be able to check if the execution order really belongs to this um, uh, to the to this valid collection uh, again in polynomial time. So one uh, strong notion of uh, security you might want from a uh, sequence rule is for the following. You might want it to be MEV proof, which essentially means that there is no uh, ordering such that the sequencer could be extracting some uh, uh, non-risk risk-free uh, risk profit, which essentially means that by ex executing some ordering, uh, he could not, you should not be able to um, uh, end up with more tokens that he had in the beginning. Um, so in this, our first version in this paper was actually to show this this very strong security guarantee was impossible. You can you cannot do it. Uh, so there's always for any essentially what we say is that for any state X and for any um, uh, uh, sorry for any for there is a, essentially we say there is a state X and there is a set of user transactions which would ensure that they sequencer could be getting a non-risk-free profit. So the example is the following. So the proof sketch uh, I'm giving here is consists of this instance where we have three identical buy orders and three identical sell orders where you're, the buy orders are buying two units of token one and the sell orders are selling one in unit of token uh, one. Uh, and the proof in the high level what you do is that you, you pick any ordering of transactions you don't specify which one belongs to the sequencer or not. And later on, you show that there is a, if this, there is a way to assign some of those transactions to the sequencer uh, such that you would be getting a risk-free profit. Okay, so for example, here you have one particular ordering and then you say, okay, uh, if this was one valid ordering for the sequencer, then if you assign the first buy order and this, uh, this sell orders in, in red to the sequencer, then you'd be making a risk-free profit. So you essentially what you can do, then you, you enumerate every possible ordering and you show there is always a way to assign um, uh, transactions for the sequencer that, so that he's getting a risk-free profit. So now let me uh, give you what the verifiable sequencing rule that we uh, that gives our positive result. To, um, Uh, so what we do is that, okay, recall the input for this sequencing rule is the initial state in, in the transactions that we have to sequence. So what we, the algorithm is going to do is that we are going to partition the set of buys and sell that have not yet be, been sequenced into groups, the set of buy and the set of sell orders. Uh, and the output of the algorithm is the execution ordering, which is initially is going to be empty. And I'm going to give you an algorithm how we can construct the output. Uh, so what the algorithm does is that while we still have buy and sales that have not yet been uh, sequenced, uh, you are going to simulate what the state of the exchange would be after the transactions in T, uh, in capital T, have been executed. So XT is the state after the transactions that have been sequenced already have been uh, executed. And you see, okay, if, there, if the amount of token one in the contract is bigger, then it would be in the beginning of the block, which essentially just is means uh, for um, for exchanges is that the price of token one is going to be uh, cheaper at state XT than it would be at state X0, uh, which means that if you execute a buy order at this particular state, that buy order is getting a better price than it would be getting by executing in the, in the beginning of the block. And what our sequence rule says, well, at this point, you should execute any buy order. So the sequencer can only execute buy orders at this point. Uh, or otherwise, uh, you should execute a sell order. Uh, and sell orders would actually get, be getting a, a better uh, price than they would be getting by executing the block. So in this phase, transactions that are sequenced during this phase, they're actually going to be getting a good execution price. So the next phase is that you might reach a point where you don't have buys and sells anymore, and, and you and then we say we, we can sequence the remaining transactions as you want. Um, so you let the sequencer sequence the remaining transactions as you want. So here one example. Um, uh, 
for uh, how this works. Um, and later, I'm going to go quickly over this example again. Um, so let me just uh, give your intuition why the sequencer removes uh, manipulation in price. So recall the example of a sandwich attack where we have uh, we have a user wants to buy a token. Uh, and the, what the sandwich attack is, is that the sequencer buys the token before the user and then they, they execute the user transaction. Uh, and this execution ordering is not valid under our sequencing rule because once the user, it, once the sequencer tries to buy a token one, the sequencing rule says that they, they because you still have out buys and sell that have not yet been executed after you execute transaction T1, then you say that the next transaction to execute can only be a sale order. Um, so this, is, this would violate the sequencing rule. So if you have a, the sequencer tries to execute a buy before the user, then they have to immediately execute a sell, and that just cancels out their transactions. And then we sequence the transaction of the, of the user. So concretely, the only valid orderings are the, these four that I have in the picture, and none of them are none of them can harm the user. And in fact, if you have a single user transaction that block, there is no way you, you, the sequencer can extract any V uh, from the user. Uh, the impossibility result I gave you really requires the block to have more than one user transaction. So any questions here? I think I see one. There we go. So we have a question in the Q&A. Um... So uh, Justin Grana asks that uh, he couldn't type fast enough during the first pause. And so he wants to just quickly ask here. Um, the, the question is, wouldn't the profits from the builders be uh, competed away? Um, or is it that, so, I mean, the argument here is that you send it to a builder and they, they, these builders would be competing and then they should compete that particular profit away, the, the MEV profit. Um... Build the profits to be. So he's me. Is are you referring to more like to uh, selling away MEV or? So I, sure. I don't. Uh, so I mean, you know, I'm. I, I don't want to answer the question for. You. Yeah. <laughs> but I imagine that uh, that Justin believes that you can build that you can choose the builder. Um, mm -hmm. I, I don't think that's the case, right? So the builder essentially get selected either at random or the builder takes an existing mempool and builds out of that mempool, right? So the builder, you can choose your builder, um, but uh, yeah, there's currently there's many builders uh, and you can choose your builder and your, uh, but what we really focus here is on how you can really check if the builder you choose is not manipulating your transaction or the price you're getting. Um, so then there's another question that we have here from Bo Zhang, which is, why don't we just do uh, one trade per block? Also, do you consider gas priority for your method to avoid front running? So one transaction per block would work, um, but it's probably, yeah, like it's probably it's gonna, people are not gonna be very happy with that solution because you can just trade, like agents cannot, essentially it's just gonna be very expensive to trade if you can only execute one transaction per block. But that would work. Um, for our solution, doesn't have gas costs because the sequencer is computing off outside the blockchain, um, so there is no cost in gas. Um, so let me uh, quickly conclude. Uh, so can I can I actually ask you a yeah. question? So since I'm since yeah. since I'm the the the, yeah. the man here. Um, so yeah. in this particular case, for your verifiable sequencing rule, you need you, you have a relatively strong informational assumption, which is that you know the state of the contract before uh, when, when you're when you make your put your transaction in, right? Um, and in many ways, this is akin to saying that you can limit the slippage to exactly the price impact that your individual trade would have had, right? because that's essentially the same thing as the verifiable sequencing output there. So would this also apply, does your result apply when you don't actually know what the state of the contract is at the time when your trade executes? And is so that this, an assumption? Yeah. So this, this is not the state when the contract executes, it's the straight, uh, sorry, it's not the, it's, it's not like you're, you're required to know the state your transaction execute. 
Uh, so maybe you might be referring. So it's essentially the state where on the beginning of the block before your transaction execute. Uh, so the idea here is that when the builder is going to build the block, he's, he doesn't, he cannot manipulate the initial state uh, many blocks ahead. Um, and given the state in the beginning of the block, then we use that as the benchmark so that he can, um, if he can, if he could not have manipulated the state in the beginning of the block, then we can use that as a benchmark for the execution price for the user. Um, but the user doesn't need to know beforehand what that state is going to be. Does that answer your question? Almost. So when there are other transactions in the block that were, let's say, legitimately uh, sent before this one, um, in this particular case, so suppose I have two identities, I'm an attacker, I give myself two identities as the as the block builder, right? And I take mm -hmm. these transactions, I take, I take actually the sandwich attack as it is. Mm. Um, and make them legitimate transaction. Would that a way to be a way around your your mechanism? Because no, yeah, here it doesn't. Yeah, here he could he can have, be having different identities. It doesn't matter. Like this, yeah, it's not. Uh, we are we don't use ident. We don't re rely on identities. Um, so, like on. for so example, I don't want to I don't want to hog the conversation. So maybe I yeah. should just let you con conclude. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Um. So let me skip this. Um, so I kind of, the proof kind of almost follows by the algorithm. Um, the only uh, kind of tricky part is when you reach a part, the, 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 the last part of the algorithm, when you you don't have, you only have buys or sells left, where essentially the argument there is that this, the sequencer, if he's trying to inject his own transactions there, then his transaction is actually going to be the first one executing in that phase. Uh, any any transaction that executes in the in the end of the algorithm, of any user transaction that executes in the end of the algorithm, the the adversary would not have incentive to execute any transaction after the user. Uh, so that's the high level idea. Um, and here I have one example of why uh, our sequence rule is not MEV proof. Uh, and you and the idea is that on average this buy order is paying a, a, a higher, uh, is paying a, lo uh, uh, a lower price than the price that the adversary is selling if he owned these two sell orders here. Um, so to conclude, uh, so we give, uh, we first we give an impossibility result on how we can design uh, deterministic sequencing rules. Um, and we show that there's always a way that the adversary could be profiting. Uh, but our positive results give a way that how a service like Flashbox Protect could be betting their reputation. They could be betting their reputation on using something that's verifiable and protect the users. So I think that there's an interesting direction about thinking how these uh, services, they could be becoming more transparent and really be betting their reputation by using algorithms that are most transparent for users. I think there's some interesting open questions. Uh, so this work only applies for exchanges that are have a pair of two tokens, like Uniswap. Uh, but there is other exchanges that uh, they pull together more than two tokens. And uh, it's an interesting question if you can generalize these ideas uh, for that setting. Uh, our impossibility result only applies for deterministic rules. Uh, so it's an interesting question. What can you do if you have randomness? Um, since I also showed that there was an impossibility to result, the interesting question is, can you actually compute the price of anarchy, which is essentially how much could the sequencer be profiting, uh, even though they are, we are proving, providing a, a predictable guarantees for users, you can ask how much can the sequencer be profiting by manipulating uh, the, the execution ordering. Um, so thank you very much. Um, and looking for questions, I guess, in the second phase. Well, thank you so much, Mateus. Um, we're moving straight on to the next paper and then do the general Q&A after uh, uh, Junsuk has presented his. So Junsuk, uh, we'll be talking about DAO governance. Um, and uh, I'll leave the floor to you. Oops. Right. Uh, thank you very much uh, for inviting me to uh, present this paper. Uh, it's a great pleasure uh, to present. 
So uh, we're going to talk about uh, DAO governance. Um, this is joint work with uh, Jung Sub Lee and Tao Lee uh, who are uh, here today. So let me uh, start with the uh, a bit of background of the paper. So, um, so here uh, we are talking about DAO, which is uh, that decentralized autonomous organization. So um, this organization is different from traditional organization. Um, it is first of all uh, organization which is running on smart contracts uh, on blockchains. So um, as you can see on the left, this is traditional organization, which is uh, which has the central point, uh, which is governing and controlling uh, the whole organization. So there's a leadership uh, who controls them. On the other hand, uh, if you look at the right hand side, uh, the, the DAO, or the decentralized autonomous organization, um, th this is dispersed, a decentralized um, organization where all the participants are connected uh, through uh, this uh, smart uh, contracts. So, um, so the, the, the big difference is that the, on the uh, traditional organization, uh, there is a controlling body. On the other hand, uh, there is no controlling body on the uh, DAO case. So, so the, um, um, the the potential benefit of that is that uh, it, it could uh, actually uh, this bot bottom up approach uh, can actually um, collect with our crowds more efficiently, and then uh, it could be more transparent, and then it can be more democratic uh, compared to the um, traditional corporations, which is having the central uh, controlling point. Um, so this DAO, uh, kind of this new type of organization, has been growing very fast. Uh, for example, uh, only uh, 2022 alone, uh, it uh, has uh, uh, tripled in terms of this number, uh, and it is uh, growing very fast, uh, even as of now. Um, uh, although uh, it has been very, uh, very popular, and then uh, we, are, we are seeing uh, this huge growth of DAOs, there is still a um, lack of understanding about this organization, especially when it gets to the governance. So as I said earlier, uh, this um, uh, absence of um, uh, controlling body uh, could be actually beneficial because it can, uh, it can be democratic and transparent, and then it can collect with all crowds uh, much more efficiently. Uh, it can also have some, some downside as well. So let's, uh, let me first talk about uh, sort of the good example and then some bad examples, and then we'll think about uh, uh, you know, what could be the economic mechanisms and then what, what could uh, go wrong and then how can we um, uh, fix that. And, and um, so that will be our um, sort of research question of this paper. So let me first uh, address uh, the, the, um, the good example of this DAO. So there's a um, kind of the well-known um, uh, DAX uh, decentralized exchange, Uniswap. Um, they have this two-step governance structure, uh, which is um, uh, sort of efficiently collecting with all crowd in a, a rather democratic manner. So they uh, 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 kind of let participants uh, first um, um, uh, sort of propose uh, changes in, in the, uh, this uh, uh, off-chain forums. And then uh, they kind of check uh, this um, uh, support from the participants, which they call temperature check. So if there are enough supports, they bring it to the uh, voting. And then um, uh, this uh, voting uh, based on tokens um, decide whether they will uh, make these changes or not. So this uh, bottom of approach uh, is uh, kind of um, uh, sort of good for harnessing collect, uh, with some, collecting with some crowds. Uh, compared to the top-down approach of the uh, traditional organizations. So it could be um, a very efficient and good, but then, uh, of course, uh, there are uh, some uh, downside uh, of this um, DAO um, uh, approach. So there are these well-known examples of um, uh, rock pools. Um, so these are the cases where uh, the um, big uh, token holders, uh, they um, uh, beat up the price or manipulate the price um, uh, very high and then um, make unfavorable changes to the system. Um, and then uh, they uh, subsequently dump them and uh, harming the minority token holders, which meant small token holders. So there are um, many examples, uh, which is uh, also happening uh, also in very recent uh, um, times as well. So uh, the, the well-known examples include the Liang Finance and the Sushi Swap. So uh, in both cases, um, uh, the, the block holder or big uh, token holders, um, the, in this case, uh, developers, they uh, made uh, unfavorable changes uh, to the system. 
and then the, uh, they just uh, dump the uh, uh, tokens when the price is very high. And then as a result, the price collapsed uh, after this uh, event and then uh, disharmed uh, the small token holders. So as you can see, um, the uh, this uh, rock pool examples um, can highlight the, the weakness or vulnerability of uh, DAO governance. So um, this is showing that there's an important issue we should uh, actually focus on here in, in terms of DAO governance, which is conflict of interest between large token holders, which is often called whale, and then small token holders. So um, DAO is very different from traditional organizations in the sense that uh, we don't need uh, active monitoring uh, because we, we don't have a principal agency uh, agent conflict. There's no management who control the organization, which could be good uh, because there's no conflict uh, between agent and principal. But on the other hand, uh, if, if you think about it, uh, this actually uh, uh, kind of uh, poses a danger uh, where these big holders, uh, whale, can capture control easily and enjoy the private benefit um, under one token, one vote uh, scheme. Why is that? Whale actually has a um, um, power to um, swing their uh, swing the vote outcomes because they have uh, enough uh, voting power. Uh, so if they want to change the voting outcome, they can uh, buy more uh, voting power by buying more tokens. On the other hand, uh, dispersed small token holders, uh, they don't have any, um, any power to do that individually. So they have uh, no incentive to acquire more, in, more, more voting power uh, or more tokens uh, to change the result. As a result, only the whale uh, has the um, incentive to do that. Uh, which result in uh, unfavorable outcomes to the small token holders. So this kind of uh, brings this uh, conflict of interest between large token holder, whale, and the small token holders uh, as a kind of um, uh, central weakness of DAO governance. So uh, in our paper, uh, we're going to study a theoretical model, uh, which is having token-based voting and then uh, uh, strategic trading by the whale and then uh, under trading cost. And then uh, we kind of test our uh, theoretical predictions using a novel DAO voting data set. So let me preview uh, the theoretical results. Um, so as I said, we study a theoretical model uh, which is featuring um, token-based token -based voting and then um, uh, the uh, token trading uh, with, uh, with the cost. So um, under this result, uh, what we find at the, at the first result is that uh, the, the value of DAO or, or growth rate of DAO is negatively correlated or associated with the uh, ownership concentration or the whale's ownership uh, of tokens. Why is that? Because uh, if a whale already owns large tokens, uh, that means uh, under one token, one vote, the whale already has uh, enough voting power. But then uh, to go over the threshold, the whale just only has to acquire only a uh, little bit uh, to, to, um, to go over the threshold and then uh, change the uh, voting outcome. So under, uh, under the um, uh, costly trading, uh, this cost is uh, rather uh, small compared to the private benefit they are getting. So as a result, uh, what we find is that the, the value of DAO is uh, having negative association with the uh, ownership concentration. But then uh, this negative correlation between um, the, the, the DAO value and then ownership concentration uh, can be mitigated uh, by uh, two factors. One is the uh, higher service value. If the platform uh, has uh, already higher value, the whale who owns large uh, stake uh, has too much to lose by making unfavorable outcome, even uh, you know, given their uh, private benefit. So uh, what we find is that um, with the higher value of the, uh, the platform already, uh, this is so, sort of mitigating uh, this uh, whale's um, uh, bad incentive. Um, the, the third outcome, which is perhaps more surprising, uh, which uh, what we show is that the illiquidity of tokens actually uh, mitigate this uh, uh, governance issues. So when token is more illiquid, uh, trading tokens become more expensive. Um, as a result, uh, when the whale wants to acquire more tokens to change the voting outcome, uh, it becomes increasingly more, more, more difficult as, as they get, gain, gain more and more coins. 
So as a as a result, um, this um, this uh, higher liquidity um, actually paradoxically helps uh, DAO governance. Um, so this is our uh, third prediction. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, more details uh, why this is happening and then how how this is different from uh, traditional organizations. And finally, um, this is uh, the, the remedy uh, to the uh, DAO governance issues. So when we actually uh, introduce a uh, long-term incentive to the whale or big uh, token holders by um, having uh, this uh, lockup period of to tokens after the voting, uh, this can actually um, uh, mitigate these governance issues. Um, if the whale actually has to hold the tokens um, long enough, and then um, the whale, uh, as a result, result will pursue more long-term long -term incentive uh, than, than the, this um, value-destroying outcomes uh, from the voting um, doesn't happen uh, uh, as often as uh, the, uh, the, the standard one token, one vote case. So the um, so these are the uh, uh, theoretical um, predictions we have, and then uh, we find that um, uh, find supporting evidence uh, from our um, DAO voting data set uh, between 2020 and 2022. Um, we have a novel um, a voting data set um, uh, on on DAOs. So um, we measure uh, the uh, the the value of DAO uh, using total value locked. Um, so this is uh, me measuring the activities uh, of um, um, DAX. So the the growth rate of the <clears throat> TVL total value locked uh, is uh, uh, negatively correlated with the um, the voting power concentration, which can be measured by uh, Herfindahl index of voting power or the um, uh, the the share of uh, top three um, the the whales or top three um, token holders. So. When, when there are uh, more concentration, what we find is the growth rate of TVL uh, grows down. Um, and then uh, our second prediction uh, is saying uh, when they have more stake to lose, uh, this, this is going to uh, mitigate uh, the, um, this uh, uh, negative association between concentration of ownership and then uh, TVL growth. Indeed, uh, we find that uh, empirically, if the lag TVL, uh, which is kind of capturing the, uh, the, the value of the uh, platform uh, is high. Uh, this actually um, uh, kind of mitigates this negative association. And uh, and the third, um, when we um, kind of um, uh, introduced uh, illiquidity of tokens, uh, which is the trading cost of uh, tokens, uh, higher illiquidity actually also mitigates uh, this negative association between concentration of ownership and then TVL growth. So uh, illiquidity uh, is um, sort of giving shield against uh, bad governance. And finally, uh, we, uh, uh, using uh, these uh, changes uh, to um, uh, this uh, um, the locking up um, points after the voting, uh, th these changes, we find that uh, there's a positive impact on the, uh, the uh, TVL growth. Uh, and then uh, this is showing that uh, inducing long-term uh, long-term incentive to the uh, to the whale uh, kind of um, uh, improves this uh, DAO governance by by mitigating uh, this um, uh, negative association between concentration and the TVL growth. So so these are the empirical findings, and then um, now I will move on to the details of the uh, the theoretical model we have. Uh, before and I move we on. Can... We can entertain a, a few questions just to clarify yeah. at this point. Maybe that's a good idea. So right. um, the, the first one comes from uh, Niklas Häusler, who's actually written on DAOs himself, as, a, as far as mm -hmm. I know. Um, mm -hmm. So he asked a question about the rug pull. So why do we see them um, you know, in, in crypto projects? And why mm -hmm. do we not see them, for instance, in traditional equities? And, and I'm going to tack something onto that, um, which, is, which is this is like we think of DAOs and the way they're often portrayed is like everything is written by a smart contract and there's an like an on-chain process by which people vote. And mm -hmm. then there's just some, some some things will be changed directly based on that vote. But the reality mm -hmm. seems to be that many DAOs require actually an active, uh, you know, there, there, there is a team still that does stuff and that still mm -hmm. has to do things. So right. I'm, I'm wondering, this also goes to your empirical results, how that feeds in. And I think these two issues are actually related. So. Okay. Um, yeah. So um, 
First of all, uh, we are considering the um, sort of pure form of um, uh, Tao. Of course, uh, there are, there could be mixture of the uh, you know the traditional um, sort of uh, organizations, but then um, um, most of Tao's uh, kind of um, you know the, what we consider here is in pure form, uh, which is kind of running on the um, running on the um, kind of smart contracts rather than uh, human form. Um, and then uh, the, the question about uh, what, is, what is the difference between, um, so wh why does this issue does not arise, um, uh, uh, didn't arise uh, in, in traditional firms? Uh, it, was it the question? Yeah, so uh, so we don't see rug pulls or the equivalent mm -hmm. thereof where a single shareholder basically, you know, uh, harms the project or the, the, the firm itself, um, mm -hmm. I believe in, in traditional finance, but we see it in, in, uh, in this case. Right. So I'll, I'm going to address the issue a bit more uh, later uh, in the theoretical part, but then I can sort of, um, you know, briefly uh, talk about the idea. So um, as I mentioned, in the traditional organization, organization there's a, this a central uh, controlling point, which is management. And then the existence of, of them uh, sort of um, um, sort of prevents um, this uh, big blockholder uh, swaying as kind of changing the results um, as they want. Of course, if they have you know enough control, uh, they they will change the management, and then uh, that that is kind of the, this the, you know uh, traditional uh, kind of governance. Um, so, in, in case of the um, uh, traditional uh, governance, the the issue is more about um, kind of monitoring uh, these agents uh, from the uh, shareholder side. But then, in case of DAO, um, because the, we have the absence of this management. Uh, we, the the um the, the issue is more about this uh, big block holders uh, kind of capturing the control uh, easily um, um, in the absence of this this um, uh, governing bodies. So um, this is kind of an uh, important point why uh, illiquidity uh, may be actually helpful in case of DAO. Um, on the other hand, we know that the uh, the traditional organizations um, the in, in the governance literature, liquidity actually tend to help uh, governance. So, so this, so there could be um, uh, sort of a you know beneficial effect of liquidity, <laughs> uh, especially with active monitoring. Uh, but then, uh, in the absence of active monitoring, actually, uh, you know, what we find here is illiquidity uh, can actually have beneficial effect. But I'm going to talk about that a little more uh, when it when it get, when you get to the model. Uh, okay. that and there's one the more question. question which I think I want to put yeah. forward, which is uh, by Bofu Zhang, which basically says, "How do you know what's a whale?" Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm paraphrasing here, but the the point he's trying to make is. You can have huge ownership without being visible as a huge owner because you could split your holdings across different addresses. Uh, so how do you how do you how do you handle that? Right. Um, yeah, that that's a kind of empirical issue, which is actually um, yeah um, yeah we've been um, uh, investigating uh, at at the moment. Um, yeah, um, it's because of because of the um, the the yeah the the limit of the data set. Um, it, it, it well you know. If this is really truly uh, dispersed, I mean, kind of, you know, sort of separate out, separate it um, in the way, um, you know, we cannot really track. Then, then we, yeah, we cannot really uh, capture that uh, in terms of data. But then, uh, we we try our best uh, as long as we can uh, sort of um, uh, identify them as um, as one uh, owner. Um, we, we kind of identify them as as the whale. But but yeah, surely there is an issue uh, about that. But hopefully that that's not an issue. Yeah. Yeah, sorry, can I can I just chip in yeah. real, real quick on mm -hmm. this issue? Now it's possible that one one big investor can control multiple wallets, right? You know, you know, this is also common uh, uh, you know across some of the platforms, but um, but you know, we can potentially use those so-called so wallet clustering services to cluster wallets. I don't think this is a perfect solution, but you know, to some extent it can help uh, quite a bit. And also if we think that this kind of underestimation of uh, 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 concentration is, is relatively random across different platforms, then it's not clear how this would uh, bias our results. But but I think in the revised version, we should definitely try wallet clustering services. Yeah. Thanks. <clears throat> All right, okay, I'm going to let you continue then. <laughs> okay, yeah. Right, so uh, for the time's sake, uh, let me just um, uh, explain the model. Um, maybe, yeah, I will just uh, try to just convey uh, the, the the core idea rather than going to the 
uh, to the uh, uh, nitty-gritty details. So this is the Infinite Horizon model um, in discrete time. Uh, we, we kind of have a DAO platform, uh, which is providing some services. And the, uh, everyone is risk neutral. Uh, there are uh, many small participants, which, which we call users. And there's one uh, big participant, which is the whale. At, at zero, uh, one unit of tokens uh, is issued and then distributed um, um, between the whale and users. Uh, at one, um, uh, there's a proposal, uh, they have to vote, uh, and then they either vote for or against the proposal. And then uh, if there are um, um, kind of, uh, kind of uh, a vote uh, for it, um, more than the threshold, it, it is implemented. And then um, T1 uh, one onward, uh, according to the change, uh, the platform begins providing services uh, to the participants. So users, um, they decide whether uh, decide uh, or decide whether to participate or not as zero uh, in the beginning. So uh, everyone has different uh, participation costs. If they think that the value of participation is uh, not not very high compared to the cost, they don't participate. But if they think the value is high um, higher than the uh, the participation participation cost, they will participate. And they are kind of um, you know infinitesimal, and then they are they're competitive. On the other hand, the whale um, at, at zero, they already uh, receive uh, some unit of uh, tokens. You can think of them as a developer or some some you know uh, some some um, entity with some special interest. And then um, uh, they uh, need to liquidate uh, by some horizon, uh, final horizon, big T. Uh, this is their kind of the time of exit. So this kind of reflects the short termism uh, they have. They could be some investors who, uh, who have sort of exit time, um, which is sort of um, already imposed. And then the, this this is kind of big uh, kind of player. Uh, therefore, uh, they uh, kind of uh, act strategically uh, in terms of trading. So um, uh, there's this one unit of tokens, uh, and then when any participants hold, uh, let's say, X unit of tokens, uh, they get utility, uh, which is A and X. What is this A? A is the technology component, but then A of small A. So, so the small A is the um, uh, decided by the uh, the voting outcome. Uh, it, depending on the voting outcome, this uh, uh, technology uh, component could be high or low. And then N is the number of participating users. Uh, this is which is going to capturing uh, the network effect of participation. This is kind of a typical assumption uh, in the uh, in uh, platform literature. And then X is uh, the ownership uh, of tokens. So if this is the kind of utility flow to the participants, uh, what's, what's going to happen is um, uh, the uh, intrinsic value of the tokens is uh, simply present value of these utility flows. Uh, as you can see, P of A, this is uh, kind of intrinsic value, which is um, just present value of A N uh, every period. Uh, but then to get this uh, utility flows, they have to trade the um, uh, tokens, and then uh, trading tokens is costly. Uh, we assume uh, quadratic or, or convex uh, trading costs, uh, which is um, often justified by the um, illiquidity uh, or, or, or transition cost, like let's say like Kyle model, but we just take a reduced form uh, to for the simplicity of the model. Okay, and then uh, we um, we have one token, one vote situation. So if there are uh, enough vote for the pro uh, proposal, uh, we'll uh, implement. So X bar is sort of the threshold they have to go over. Uh, so so uh, 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 Whales um, may vote for it, or, and users may vote for it, and then if some of them uh, go over threshold, uh, basically uh, we'll implement that. And then um, uh, the small a uh, is outcome of the voting. If a is i, we, which means uh, we implement, or we mean uh, reject. So um, there could be many different cases, uh, but then for the sake of simplicity, we focus on the case where uh, there's conflict between users and the whale. So basically, uh, for users, um, they prefer rejecting the proposal because this is going to uh, destroy the value. Um, but then the whale uh, may still want to do that because they uh, may enjoy private benefit even at the cost of the um, destroying public value. So A of R is a technology component in case we reject. Uh, well, we assume that this is greater uh, than the uh, case of implementing. 
So uh, theta is sort of a fraction of the uh, value we lose by uh, implementing it. But then a whale, on the other hand, enjoys some private, private benefit. So private benefit may be uh, positive or, or zero with some probabilities. So mu is the probability that whale actually has some uh, positive um, private benefit here. OK, so now we're going to solve the problems of uh, users and whale. Let me first talk about the user's problem. So uh, we just um, uh, kind of um, use um, a rational expectations equilibrium here. So uh, users rationally expect the uh, price process given the uh, voting outcomes, uh, given the um, uh, the parameters of the model. So they uh, use because users are competitive, they take the price process as a given, and then they maximize their value. So here, value function is um, uh, represented uh, recursively. So every period, uh, uh, the users uh, trade the tokens, and then they get the uh, utility flows according to their ownership, X. And then uh, whenever they trade, they uh, pay the price of the tokens. And then uh, uh, the, uh, this um, uh, the, the second component of trading is the transition cost they have to pay. And then they, this is continuation value. So we can uh, have close some solution for this uh, value of users. Uh, with a simple uh, solution like this. Alpha, uh, which this is the, um, uh, the the value of the trading tokens uh, over time. This is sort of the uh, the value coming from market making these, these tokens. This is uh, coming from the sort of trading profits. On the other hand, uh, this X is the kind of the current holdings. And then beta is the per unit uh, kind of intrinsic value, which is uh, actually the, the tokens intrinsic value given implementation of uh, this action A. And given that, uh, the optimal trading strategy of the user is given by uh, this simple form. So given the price, um, basically, uh, the, the trading uh, kind of uh, demand by the users is given by this. OK, so the, uh, the, um, given this, uh, they, we can actually get the inverse demand function of the users. And then using the market clearing condition by the uh, users and the whale, um, we can actually get the uh, price function as the trading volume of the whale. And then uh, given that, what's going to happen is whales' uh, effective trading cost uh, actually has two components. One is a uh, price impact component that coming from their strategy trading, and then the uh, transition cost. So effectively, uh, whales' transition cost is actually uh, some of uh, these two components. So we're going to call it uh, lambda w. Uh, compared to uh, just lambda, uh, which is the, tr uh, the, the transition cost uh, for um, the, the users. So uh, whale's going to solve uh, uh, kind of similar problem. But in, in this case, um, whale actually is a strategic trader. And then whale actually th thinks about uh, also uh, kind of the accumulating voting power to, to manipulating the voting outcome. So uh, we, we solved this problem. Uh, so. Basically, at T1, we do voting. And so we're going to first solve about solve the, uh, the case with T2 after the voting. And then when we solve the problem, we have this uh, kind of simple closed solution. So the value of the whale is given by the intrinsic value of the token they hold. And then the second part is the uh, trading cost uh, for, for liquidation. Because if they have this uh, big T uh, sort of exit period, before that, they have to uh, kind of uh, liquidate the asset. And then, like in Kyle model, they're going to just split their uh, or, you know, uh, demands, or order flows uh, in small pieces so that they minimize their trading cost. So uh, in the end, um, uh, they have this uh, uh, trading volume. But then this depends on how much time that they have left. When they have very small time left, this transition cost increases. When they have more time left, they will split their uh, trading volumes in small pieces. They have lower trading cost as a result. So this is the uh, outcome here. And then uh, finally, we solve the uh, value at one uh, when they uh, do voting uh, for, for the whale. So uh, in case the whale implement, they enjoy the private benefit, but then their intrinsic value is lower because they destroy the value. And then trading cost uh, is coming in two pieces. One is uh, a trading cost of acquiring more, more coins uh, to go over the threshold. And then subsequently, they have to liquidate all those coins. So they're going to have um, a much higher trading cost. On the other hand, if they don't implement that, of course, they don't enjoy the private benefit. And then, but then they have higher intrinsic value uh, because they uh, don't destroy the value. But then trading cost also goes down because they don't have to acquire more coins. So uh, it's really trade off, trade off between having private benefit uh, and then uh, in, you know, having other costs. So delta V, which is the, the wedge between uh, this uh, value of implementing and not implementing, is um, trading off uh, private benefit and loss in intrinsic value and um, the incremental trading cost. 
So if this is positive, the whale will uh, implement the project uh, proposal, otherwise uh, will reject. Okay, sorry. Um, so um, um, we, uh, what we find is that this uh, wedge um, is increasing in uh, ownership of uh, ownership concentration. If the whale already owns a lot of coins, uh, tokens already, and having this uh, marginal um, tokens to change the voting outcome is not that costly. So therefore, uh, it actually increases with the, um, the, the concentration of ownership. On the other hand, if we actually have a, a lot of value to lose, uh, this is going to mitigate uh, this, um, uh, this motive of the whale. And then also, if the, the lambda trading cost increases, this is also going to uh, mitigate this impact because the, the whale, for the whale, uh, getting more and more coins becomes tokens becomes more more costly uh, uh, for for manipulating uh, the the, vote, the voting outcome. So uh, let me talk about the equilibrium process, price process under this uh, scheme. So when they implement uh, the equilibrium price process, uh, first uh, goes up very high because the whale actually has to accumulate a lot of voting power. So this uh, buying pressure pushes the price uh, above the intrinsic value, but once they manipulate the result, subsequently they're going to just dump the, uh, uh, the, the tokens uh, to exit. So by the time they exit fully, the price goes back to fundamental value. But then you see the price pattern. Once first it goes up very high, then it goes down uh, uh, dramatically, and then uh, eventually uh, recover back to intrinsic value. This is kind of typical pump and dump or rock pool uh, sort of incident uh, price patterns. On the other hand, uh, the, the, if the whale doesn't engage uh, in this um, uh, voting, uh, basically the price process is kind of slightly um, uh, depressed because the whale wants to liquidate, but then the, the impact is much smaller in this case. So you, you, you see the, uh, the big difference in price, price processes. And finally, I'm gonna close the model uh, by um, solving the, the, uh, this participation of the users so users are basically uh, expecting these outcomes um, uh, if they think there's a, a more possibility of whales uh, destroying the value by manipulating the, the voting outcome, they will participate less. If they think whales not going to do that, they will participate more. Therefore, uh, the, the, the total value of the uh, platform uh, is affected by um, the possibility of the, um, uh, this whales um, uh, um, adverse incentive. So, so th this gives us, um, uh, the, the, these two propositions gives us um, our three predictions. First, uh, higher ownership concentration, district of value. And then second, uh, if there is uh, more service value to be lost uh, by the uh, uh, whale's uh, adverse incentive, uh, basically uh, way, uh, this negates these uh, uh, kind of uh, bad outcomes because the whale uh, doesn't want to boost this public value. And third, uh, higher liquidity actually uh, helps also mitigating this uh, uh, bad uh, governance of, by the um, by the whale. So let me address the issue uh, be, be, uh, which was asked before. So uh, basically, we kind of uh, uh, verify this triangular relationship between platform value and then token ownership concentration and token trading. So what, what do we find here? Uh, actually, higher illiquidity uh, can shield users against bad uh, governance. This is somewhat uh, paradoxical, but then this is actually uh, in line with the quadratic voting scheme. Uh, quadratic voting scheme is saying uh, they prevent the concentration of uh, voting power by one, one party uh, by making it uh, increasingly more, more expensive. So actually, illiquidity is doing the uh, kind of a natural uh, quadratic voting here. So this result uh, actually uh, also hinges on the uh, DAO's uh, property. It doesn't really require active monitoring. In the traditional governance literature, we actually know that uh, higher liquidity can help governance. Why is that? In, uh, when the uh, block holders uh, uh, wants to exit, uh, then in the ab this absence of block holders can actually create uh, this governance issues. But then if there's a higher, li higher liquidity of the, um, of the uh, equities, uh, this uh, new new block holders can emerge uh, rapidly. They can kind of um, accumulate the enough voting power, and then they can control the management and monitor uh, them. So therefore, uh, actually, liquidity can help um, um, sort of in traditional uh, governance uh, because of this monitoring issue. But then we don't have any monitoring issue here, so there's no benefit of, about that. Therefore, actually, here illiquidity uh, can act, uh, kind of uh, act as a shield against these bad governance. So we have benefit. Um, than the cost. 
And then uh, finally, um, let me just briefly talk about this um, lockup period. So if there's a lockup period, uh, basically this is going to make this uh, transition period uh, really short. What's going to happen is uh, in very short period, uh, the whale uh, uh, will be forced to liquidate because they, they are holding this um, uh, tokens long enough to after voting. Then uh, this means trading, trading costs will go up. Uh, this actually effectively um, uh, make the whale um, kind of uh, stay away from um, implementing bad project. So uh, this is kind of giving uh, sort of long-term incentive to the whale, and then this is going to uh, mitigate this uh, uh, sort of negative association between ownership concentration and the value. So, um, uh, by, so by the way, uh, how much time do I have? Sorry, um, you should come to an end actually. Oh, okay. Already... So let, let me just then, then uh, kind of conclude because yeah, all these outcomes uh, of empirical uh, kind of, they are sort of pr pretty much kind of in line with uh, our theoretical prediction, but then um, yeah. Um, so, uh, but but we uh, let me just um, uh, briefly mention that we have um, uh, kind of a very uh, kind of a, you know good uh, voting data set, and then uh, kind of we find uh, all the empirical outcomes uh, in line with that. So let me conclude. Um, uh, you know, we, we study a theoretical model of uh, DAO governance, and then we uh, and then uh, we find empirical uh, findings supporting this um, uh, this prediction. So we study sort of triangular relationship between value of the DAO and the ownership concentration and trading token trading. So I mean, let me just uh, yeah conclude here. Thank you very much. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Um, and, and thanks to both speakers for their excellent presentations. Um, we now have time for the open Q&A. Um, and I want to encourage you to put the questions into the chat, which I, I have seen there now. But before I read this out, I'm just going to very rudely put my own question in first. And it goes to Jun Suk. So yeah. just, just to be clear, um, in your data, how can you differentiate uh, the possibility that, for instance, there is a single, I, mean, I don't know enough about the particular DAOs that you picked, but I tried to allude earlier to the problem that in, in many cases, there's actually a centralized control in some form, right? Uh, I mean, there's the votes, which can be decentralized, but then the execution still has to happen by an entity, a person or the like. And so um, first, maybe you can say something a little bit about the nature of the data or the DAOs that you look at. And secondly, is there in case you can't differentiate, if you don't have a differentiation there, is there any sense in which the lower value, for instance, could be triggered by the fact that a particular DAO or a set of DAOs are more likely to be essentially require centralized execution, which creates extra risk? Mm, yeah, thanks. I, I guess um, uh, perhaps um, uh, uh, my co-authors um, have a better answers about uh, this uh, because uh, yeah uh, they kind of know better about the data than me so um yeah. how or uh or yeah. do you have any answer okay so regarding the data uh we are mostly using off the chain voting here because because we found that for for most of the governance platforms uh off chain voting is much more popular than on chain voting due to lower fees um so Right now, we don't have data on whether any platform is going to require, you know, any team or a third party to kind of implement the, uh, you know, decentralized voting results. But potentially, we can collect this data and see whether we have any cross-sectional results. And and by the way, our data um, are from Snapshot, which is a very popular um, you know, off-blockchain voting revenue, uh, you know, uh, avenue, which is used by I think, but almost pretty much all of the all of the DAOs, except a few uh, bigger ones. And also, I think I need to add some kind of impact. You know, if there is some case like maybe many of you are aware of the Arbitrum, you know, the incidents recently, right? So the smart contracting on you know, the proposal vote is not automated. You know, there are some human, you know, the interference, and then if there is. First of all, you know, our DAOs are you know, relatively large ones and then the established ones. So you know, such instances are less likely. And if there are you know, some instances like that, then you know, you know, it could actually just uh, add some noise to our empirical analysis. So we are actually finding the results against the measurement errors. So the pretty much the strong results, you know, consistent you know, with the, the three predictions. Actually, I, I bet you know this could be the lower bound. Okay. 
Well, it's it's just a general concern. I try to express this concern that you from regulators. Um, for instance, mm -hmm. I mean, just to give you an example, recently there was a vote, I think it was an Arbitrum, where there was a particular vote on how some of the funds for the foundation should be used. And uh, the vote was against a particular proposal. And then the foundation, foundation essentially said, well, we spent the money anyway already. So you're out of luck. Right. So, so the I point think that actually that highlights the, you know, the structure of the DAO governance and the execution of the DAO governance. Both are very important. So Right. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah okay so anyway so it's more of a question of what's actually the state of DAOs. do we actually really have DAOs, or is it just a you know an existing organizational structure with giving the pretense of more impact uh, more say right um but yeah. sorry i don't want to hog the conversation let me just quickly go through some of the questions here so shooting Wu asked the question of can you say a little bit more about the empirical beta in particular can you you've just done this tower has done it a little bit but maybe tower can you just circle back and just very briefly describe the voting platforms that you're using yeah, so uh, regarding data, we actually use data from three places. One is, you know, number one is the snapshot uh, voting results, which is at an individual wallet level. And we we merge this data with uh, data from DeFi Llama because we are looking at those DeFi platforms per se, not not some obscure DAO that you know has you know, has no function or you know, has function that is not important. So basically these are, our set is the uh, DAOs that are operating DeFi platforms. Um, and also we require that those platforms have price data from CoinMarketCap, which is the most popular you know, data feed on prices. So once we join those three uh, uh, data sets, we are left over with about uh, a little bit over 200 uh, large um, DeFi platforms that have a DAO structure. And we verify that those DeFi platforms uh, in aggregate uh, have about 80% of the TVL of all the, all the DeFi platforms. So it seems like we do capture a very large proportion of uh, all, the, all the DeFi platforms. Okay. Yeah. So I'm going to have uh, one more question for you, and then I'm going to ask a question to Mateos. But uh, one more question that is here in the chat or in the Q&A is um, regards to the theoretical model. And the question there is from Zheng Yuju is, you know, if the results would have at all be affected if the, uh, you know, the, the whale would be actually behaving in an oligopistic, oligop oligopolistic manner rather than a monopolistic manner. Sorry. Yes, um, that's a very good question. So... Of course, um, uh, there could be uh, some some uh, some difference with the oligopolistic model, but then uh, to the extent that um, the whale has a bigger swing uh, than the uh, than the uh, dispersed individuals, uh, that doesn't uh, change. So basically, this dispersed um, uh, smallholders, uh, although they are the ones who are pursuing public value, they have absolutely no incentive to acquire more more voting power and then change the result. So uh, if there are competing uh, whales, of course, it will be different, but then they are the ones who will ha actually have incentive to do this uh, uh, kind of changes. Therefore, uh, this uh, conflict between big holders and the small holders will stay, still stay there. But yeah, but then for further impact, uh, we will, of course, have to, have to in investigate that. Yeah. Okay. So now moving on to ask some questions to Mateos. Um, <laughs> Olga Klein asked a question regarding... Um, limiting price impact. So um, so she asked essentially whether it's possible to limit the price impact. I'm going to ask this question just a slightly different way. I'm going to ask, so considering that many platforms like Uniswap have a slippage limit that you can specify, can you elaborate further on the respective differences that your sequencing model has or advantage that it has relative to, uh, to, to the slippage limit? Yeah, so yeah, so there you can use the slippage. Um, the problem there is that there's like if someone is manipulating price, they could still force you to pay that limit. So like if you put a slippage limit of one person, they are gonna make you pay that one person extra. Uh, so yeah, they would extract that as a rent on on the user. Uh, our solution is what was interesting is that it actually doesn't require a slippage limit, like you can actually just set a market order and it and it protects the user. So the user doesn't have to think about like setting a limit on on the slippage. 
So can I ask, uh, so the way you envision this in, in detail is, so you create a verifiable order. Um, now, does that mean that the way, you, the way this would be implemented is this can execute if and only if the order is not, the, the verifiable order is not uh, is not there? Or is, so is this an automated mechanism? Or does this re still require some level of trust that the block builder, the validator doesn't take except the block, which comes from a block builder that works that yeah. way? Yes, it's a great question. So, I mean, there's many, I think there's many ways you can implement it because so we could implement it using trust, right? Because if something is an entity betting on their reputation, then they, and then because it's verifiable, like anyone can check. Uh, and, but there, the fact that it's verifiable also implies that you can automate it, right? You can actually have a, a like a rule in a contract saying, well, if you don't, if someone can find a proof that you deviate, then you're gonna, maybe that the order should not execute or maybe you're gonna be punished or like you, you might be required to stake something. But I would say, well, what's really important is if it's verifiable, there's many ways you can implement it. You can implement based on trust or you can implement via a contract. Right. Well, the difference there is probably that of recourse, yeah. right? Because yeah, the recourse is a problem. And can I actually add something? I think one thing also that happens is if you had a slippage limit, there's a possibility that somehow you set this wrong and then the trade gets included in the block but doesn't execute and you have to pay the gas fee. So I think that's also a downside of particular slippage limit usage, right? Yeah, yeah. So uh, yes, yeah, so you also have to pay a gas fee even. Uh, I mean, it's kind of like Flashbots protect, they, they promise not to execute your transaction if it's going to fail. So uh, yeah, so there is ways to get around that, but in general, it's a, it's a problem where you, you you have to pay a, the transaction fee even if your transaction fails. I mean, it's it's always a little iffy when we want to build a trustless, yeah. when we try to use a trustless blockchain and we kind of have to trust a protocol to do the right thing. And if it's based only on reputation, I think that's really not the way how we think about a blockchain, right? So at least that's not yeah. the philosophy, right? Yeah, yeah. It's not a criticism, it's more of a general statement. Yeah. So, um, I mean, I, I don't have another question here for for, for Mateos. Uh, if, if anybody has further questions, we still have a few minutes technically in this webinar. Um, if not, then I would like to go quickly back to the DAO question. Well, Mateos can chime in too if he has. What do you think is the state of DAOs? Where we, where are we actually at? Do we actually have DAOs, or is this really just, you know, uh, and and you know, an old thing in in uh, just using a, a new new fancy term for it? So the question here, for instance, is the question of oftentimes it has to, requires, and I come, keep coming back to this, oftentimes a DAO vote requires somebody to do something. There's two things on that. A, you have to trust that the person does it. And B, actually means that the smart contract that may have to be changed is under the control of potentially one or a few uh, people, uh, which that's the kind of thing that attracts regulatory scrutiny. So where are we at, actually? Is that, am I, am I wrong with my statement there? Or there's still a lot to solve? Um, sorry, is, is this directed to Matthias or, or to me? No, no, to us, yeah. Anybody to wants us. to answer my yeah, question? Okay, so, yeah, yeah. Let, let me make a quick comments and then maybe, you know, I, I'll let the other panelists uh, uh, kind of comment on that. Sorry. So uh, given that I kind of uh, initiated. So I, okay, so about the uh, DAO, there, there are uh, some DAOs actually who have um, sort of a human component, which are the uh, often called curators. So, so there are actually some, some human uh, who is doing sort of some controlling, but then the role of controlling is supposed to be uh, relatively small, uh, you know, kind of rather admin the duties uh, rather than uh, the actual management uh, of, of the uh, firms. So uh, supposedly uh, they are, uh, you know, uh, they're kind of doing much kind of minor roles. And then many of uh, DAOs don't actually uh, don't have the curators at all. So I, I, I believe uh, we are moving toward, uh, you know, really decentralized uh, organizations. But of course, this is, there is there's transition. Uh, so, um, yeah, maybe we are somewhere in the middle. And then perhaps I will uh, yeah, finish. Here. And let me just add one, one thing that I observe in practice these days, because they're actually tokenized securities, especially, you know, uh, using the off-chain assets, bring them to the on-chain. So those kind of, you know, projects, Essentially, there are some central body that's always required as a kind of you know safe you know, gatekeeper or you know 
doing the custody or some kind of registry type of services. So depending on the purposes of the you know platforms, you know the economy is going. So you know there could be the various web, you know 2.0, web 2.5, or web 2.8, or even web you know, 3.0, right? Depending on the purposes and which one is the most you know efficient organization for, you know that's you know what market will select. But in terms of the 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 exact definition of the web three, right? I think the what Chang Sok said is you know correct. There is a tendency toward the web three, but for the different purposes of the platform businesses, maybe what we eventually want may not be web three, maybe web two point eight, or that's you know what it is. So it's actually evolving, but it, it's evolving in the various ways. That's my view. Yeah, I mean, you know, this is a really interesting question. Um, you know, I think I, th I believe there's uh, there there was a recent uh, uh, court ruling that says if you actually vote uh, your tokens, your tokens could be deemed as securities. So you know, you know, it could be that regulation is coming to the to the space sooner or later. But then, how would the regulators regulate DAOs? It's kind of not clear, right? I don't. I don't think at this point anybody has any idea how to regulate regulate DAOs. But but I mean, this regulation is actually missing at this point. So um, you know, yeah, I don't know. Um, so it seems to be having a pretty uncertain uh, future. Well, the one thing I will say is uh, securities regulation always seems to be something where the onus is on an issuer. In in the, there's also a component of securities regulation where uh, large holders have to. Um, we know this from from corporate finance research, right? For mergers and acquisitions and so on, they actually have to reveal that they have holdings and then they have to state what their intentions are, right? In the I think it's ten Ks or so. And uh, so for DAOs, we don't have that. And in principle, what you are studying is effectively the the economic impact that would happen if we don't have a uh, commitment, let's say, on the side of the whale to to behave one way or another, right? Now, if you were to make a decision, if you would be the regulator, would you say, given the results that you see, is it worth actually going through the effort inquiring everybody to reveal what they hold? Or is it sufficient? Is the market able to figure it out based on the data that is available on the public blockchain? Hmm. So that's, that's very, uh, yeah. Uh, very deep question. So, I guess that there are benefits and and then uh, you know costs of doing this. Um, DAO uh, is sort of a, in a way um, is pursuing sort of a you know decentralized autonomous um, way. It's kind of imposing this kind of um, you know full revelation uh, dec the disclosure is sort of against the, the very philosophy of um, uh, you know DAO. Uh, but then on the other hand, uh, indeed. Um, uh, you know, having uh, sort of a um, hidden uh, ownership can have um, sort of a negative impact um, when it gets to um, sort of um, Im implementing sort of voting uh, mechanisms and things like things like that. So, so I guess um, yeah, well, we'll, we'll, um, I guess it could be a case by case. It, it, many many um, DAOs actually uh, kind of um, uh, sort of um, um, assume let's say quadratic uh, voting system. And then, in case of that, uh, is you know, especially that will be the problem if they can actually hide their ownership uh, in in many different accounts. So, it, press there uh, by disclosing all the ownership, they can benefit. But then, uh, if they are actually uh, using more of the market uh, based open open market based um, um, kind of trading and then and then voting uh, based on token ownership, uh, that um, negative impact will be uh, smaller. So, um, I guess we'll have to uh, really think about uh, different cases. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think I don't want to tire the audience any further. <laughs> My questions. <laughs> um, I want to thank the two the, the presenters and also the co-authors who attended and and Fahad for hosting this uh, this webinar. And I want anybody who attended also to thank you and thank you for your for your questions. Um, 